Hey, Great Bill. job. That song reminds me. Remember I was telling you earlier about getting a phone call from Merle at 3.30 in the morning to go fishing on an out houseboat. Well, he had just recorded that song, and that was the background, that record, to our fishing because they were playing it on the boat, the record player. That's what. how long ago that's been. Great song, great record. Hank Cochran wrote it. She's yeah. a great singer. Did you catch any fish that day? No. <laughs> they didn't like the song, I guess. <laughs> I did. T. Graham, you have been uncharacteristically quiet today. Well, you know, the thing about it is, is these boys have been telling such great stories. And you know what, guys? I noticed when, when y'all were singing, when y'all went to sit down, y'all loved on each other pretty good with your hands. I watched that, and man, it was like they're, they're brothers, you know? I, I got that from, from over here. It was really, it was. They're not through, they go sing some more well, for this. But over. it was sweet, no kidding. I, I'm, Thanks, I'm T. in all seriousness. Thank you, brother. But anyway, I mean, I think everybody's been listening. Uh, more than talking, but I'll talk. What you want to talk about? <laughs> so, got something to say. Well, I, I, I got a couple of great uh, 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 drinking and smoking weed stories, yeah. but but Carry we, on, brother. but Weedicut prohibits me from saying it. Well, depending on what state you're in. Yeah, Weedicut. That's etiquette, but when you're talking about weed, it's Weedicut. I'm looking at Bear. I love Bear over there. <laughs> but anyway, I'll tell you one quick one. The ultimate compliment, I th he took it as the ultimate compliment. I was out on the road with him. I can't remember where we were, but I would go out and I would always forget. I had some albums I wanted him to sign. And every time I'd leave the house, I'd forget them. Well, this time I finally remembered them. And it was a stack of them about that big. And you know how you listen to people's albums over and over and they get all fuzzy on the corners and the, the uh, cover splits open, you got tape on it and all that. So I, so I walked up on his bus, you know, and uh, he was sitting there, and I, I said, hey, man, I, I don't want to wear you out, but I got a few things I want you to sign. So I set him down. He thought that, he took that as the highest compliment. He said, man, Brown, you've listened to these things, right? And I said, yes, sir. He, that, that was really, he took that as a high compliment, and it, and it is a high compliment. <laughs> I love Merle. I, I, I've tried to sing like him before, and, you know, like everybody else, I grew up listening to him. Any particular reason you chose to do Big City? I just like it, man. That album uh, just knocked me down. And that was one of the fuzzy ones. <laughs> but, yeah, Big City. I love Big City. Can I sing it? Absolutely. I, I, I believe that's uh, a picture from that it album is. right there. It yeah. is, man. Oh, he was a... sitting, on a, sitting on a bed in a hotel room. Yeah, in Europe. Like in Europe. It's yeah. in Europe he took that picture. Really? That's why he looks so pissed they off. They did him right back. <laughs> 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 but anyway, guys, this has been really, really cool having y'all here and listening to all the good Thank stories. You, I mean, it's great to hear it from the horse's mouth. Kick it off back there, Wichita. All right. Yeah, and I big city turned me loose and said 
me free I'll play it Go hang Well, I've been working every day since I Now, you know what, so, Merle Let me Haggard. tell you one thing about Jimmy, though. Pardon me. So, so you know, Jimmy's in the Musician's Hall of Fame now. Well, I've been trying to get him to do this. You know how an athlete, baseball, whatever player, if they're in the Hall of Fame, they'll sign their name, and then they'll put their number in HOF, whatever. I'm trying to get him to start doing that. But, you know, Jimmy Caps, HOF 15. <laughs> he won't, but he won't do it. Cleft note or something. <laughs> He's shy. <laughs> like Thank you, you man. just like you <laughs> Almost got Tia, what, get, give me that one more time about the simplicity Tia Goins the, oh. the, your, what'd you say something simple uh, complex simplicity complex, do you know what with two words in the song T. Graham just sang he made a statement your so called social security and you know Sheila my wife Sheila Ever since she's been telling me all these years, she said, I wish he'd have said your, uh, so, uh, your social so-called security. She likes it that way. <laughs> but it's hard to rewrite Merle, you know. You better not try. Was, was he trying to make I don't know. 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 I do called <laughs> social security. I just wondered what he was. Cause well, you know, that, the, not many people would have said that. You know, um, the, the government, the government uh, of America is lo slowly losing its mind. Um, <laughs> it's been in decline for a while. The people are fine, most of them anyway. And um, yeah, Dad has watched the, uh, the government dependency in America, which is going to be the ruination of America. And uh, if we don't turn this thing back around to just good old hard work. Anyway, he, he's always throwing little digs in there like rainbow stew and things like that, you know, that you know, the politicians and all the, yeah, he's a, he's common sense, common sense conservative man, but yeah, he's always making little statements and that's so-called social security. There's nothing so secure about it. <laughs> Ask the politicians. We're going to, you know. So, yeah, he, he, but he was, he was never afraid smart, of it. Alec. Hmm? He was never afraid to make a statement. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Well, no, what he got to be afraid of, you know? That's right. Uh, he lives in America. He's Merle Haggard. Yeah. Yeah, he ever, he, he paid, a lot of people have died all over the world so he can talk however he wants to. By George. And Chris Thompson, by the way, to add to Tia's deal, Chris Thompson said that my dad was the, the master of simplicity. That was his definition of my dad. And, that, and, and of course, Chris was probably the master of complexity. Okay, okay. But, but really, that's a good definition of dad. Yeah. Mo Pitney probably looks at this differently than anybody else in this room because I'm, I'm guessing you're the youngest one in the room. Other than Ben. Well, Ben, yeah. Ben. Yeah. Ben. 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 Yeah. yeah. What's your perspective? What was your perspective growing up 
uh, of Merle Haggard. I know you kind of cut your teeth in in bluegrass. Bluegrass. Music. Of course, we've established well, that Merle loved bluegrass. What what kind of uh, feelings did you have growing up about, about Merle Haggard? Well, I can tell you. I can explain it this way. I started with bluegrass, and uh, I found Keith Whitley's music. And that bridged the gap from, because he played bluegrass, that bridged the gap from bluegrass to country for me. And I went backwards from Keith. And when I hit Merle Haggard, I stopped. <laughs> and uh, just uh, got all I could get of it. And uh, I'm not one. There's, so, there's people here that have a lot more knowledge of all the records and stuff. All I could tell you is when something moves me, uh, I never forget it. And... Um, Merle's music just, uh, it moved me. And I, like you were saying earlier, which was something that um, actually r really kind of, in my walk of faith and everything, I've, I've, I've tried to understand the meaning of music and why God made music. And you touched on it a little bit. But it, um, like even in gospel music, sometimes I felt like I was only getting half the story with that like like everything's always great and good and and um, and it's been my experience that I mean some of the most put together people I know in the world where it seems like everything's perfect you look just under the surface and and there's chaos and uh, Merle wasn't afraid to write about that part of life and I, I knew um, with me, with the, just the troubles that I had internally, spiritually, and whatever, I had to find somebody that felt the same way I did about certain things, and, and Merle did. And uh, I love that you said, what about the hope? Because uh, cause there is hope in his music, and I'm so glad to know from an inside source that he, that he, he found, found it, especially in those last years, a little what you were said, the secret to life. But uh, um, I, I, I saw the hurt and I had to relate with somebody uh, myself, and uh, I got that from Merle. What do people? What do you say when people look at you? Because I've I've heard them do this. They look at Mo Pitney, and they call you and your gener your people the the future of country music, specifically calling you the future of country music. Um, I just play country music. <laughs> um, I I. I don't think if anybody tried to go out to be successful doing what they did, I I don't know. I think you lose, you know, being real. And everybody's trying to put their finger on what made Merle Merle, and he was just Merle. He just sang what he knew, and uh, I want to do that. If I'm singing for ten people or ten thousand, you're off to a good start. How about Lionel Sanders? Yeah. Yes. Boy, it'd be really hard to get jealous of that kid right there. <laughs> yeah. You're making me sick. Hey, can you say anything intelligent? I mean, no. <laughs> I, I can't wait till you grow up. Yeah. I'm gonna vote yeah. for him. This is. Uh, <laughs> I need a job, by the way. Uh, yeah. Um, this is a song about a father's love, I believe. <clears throat> Tonight, there'll be candlelight and roses In that little country chapel that's almost falling down And there'll be tears in this old farmer's eyes when I give my one possession to that city boy from town, his hair's a little longer than we're used to, but I guess I should find something good to say about
about this man who's won the farmer's daughter and will soon become my son-in-law today But somehow we made a home of this old farmhouse And love was all my baby ever knew He could be the richest man seven counties and not be good enough to take her hand but he swears he really loves the farmer's daughter and I know the farmer's daughter Job, Mo. Mo Pitney. Marty, you, you said you, you said you had something you wanted to say. Yeah, um, we've been. Me and my brothers are sitting here, and um, you guys, T said some nice things, but uh, that farmer's daughter reminded me we do have some sisters, okay? And um, I'm so proud of my sisters. Dad's dying has um, really brought my his kids together in a way never before, um, and I just wanted you guys. I wish you could. Got to meet my sisters. Um, Dana, she's the oldest. She's one year older than me, but probably the best friend I've ever known. And um, just as good a person as there is in the world. And my sister Kelly, just a gorgeous girl. And I, I love her so much. And, um, and then my little, my little sister Nessa, or Jen Nessa. And um, I just want you not to forget that this is not the best he has to offer. They're not here, okay? <laughs> and um, I wanted my sisters to be recognized because my dad, Loved his girls. Okay. That's great of you to say. Yeah. Take that, Jenny Seeley. Yes. Thanks, Marty. <laughs> Do they sing, Marty? Do they sing they, too? I don't know. Does Janessa sing? No. Uh, I'll bet she can. Dana, but, um, Dana can sing. She's like a bird. Um, Dana, yeah, she's a pistol. Kelly um, sings. She just won't do it. Yeah. Kelly's. Kelly was a cosmopolitan model when she was. Like in her teens, she's gorgeous, and, you know. And um, but um, she's even prettier in here. I think she dated you know? Donald Trump, didn't she? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Now your your dad had at least one. Did he have two sisters? One sister. One sister. One sister. One sister. One brother. Okay. And now where was it? Was Merle the oldest? No, no. He was the youngest by about fourteen years. Oh. Okay. Um, Aunt Leo. The classiest woman I've ever known in my life. Um, she's um, 93 now. She's the one who put the memorial service together out in Bakersfield. Aunt Leo was a school teacher, and um, she had, so funny, so humorous, but yet so classy. Just one of the most balanced individuals. I love my Aunt Leo. And my Uncle Lowell, he was a hard-working electrician, cowboy, and horses and stuff, outdoorsy kind of guy. Um, and, and he had one son. We had one cousin about the Haggard side. I heard Flossie say one time that somebody, speaking of Merle's, Merle's mom, your, your grandmother, she said that when people would come up to her and say, you're Merle Haggard's mother, 
she would say, yeah, and I'm also Lil and uh, Lonnie's. About what I just did with my sisters, yeah. yeah. You know, um, I'm, I'm proud of my Grandma Haggard and Grandpa Haggard. And, um, you know, yeah, you know, that's how I feel. It's just like good grief. You know, my dad ain't the only child, you know. She loved them all equally, just like the father does us. Jeannie, I hardly recognize you sitting so far away from me. You're usually right over here when we're doing uh, the family reunion shows. Yeah, um, what an honor it is to be sitting here today with the Haggard family royalty, by the way, and y'all are. And I, I had to laugh because you are so typical brothers. <laughs> I wish the cameras had, I hope they have been on them a good bit of the time because the poking and the punching and the, <laughs> just such typical. Yeah. <laughs> Leave me alone. But, wait, wait. but it's great to be here with you and I'm happy to be here too. Which Merle Haggard song are you going to do? Well, I'm going to do Everybody Has the Blues. And uh, but I want I was glad Ray mentioned Bonnie because well my first earliest memories of meeting Merle was back in about sixty three or sixty four. The the foundation that was the forerunner of the ACM awards was first called the VIP Awards, maybe some of you remember. And uh, Merle won the most promising male vocalist and I won most promising female. And when I was, we were to be seated at this table, and I was a nervous wreck, and we've laughed about it years later, that I was scared of Merle Haggard, because my mama had always warned me to stay away from anybody who had been in prison. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Merle and I laughed about it so many years later, he'd come up and say, are you still scared, <laughs> you know? But... Um, what a wonderful man Merle Haggard was. We've talked a lot about his, his music, and there's not much I can add that hasn't been said about that. But when uh, Merle and Bonnie, when Merle first started hitting and they come back to Nashville, Merle and Bonnie would come in their camper and they would park up at the old, uh, um, I can't remember the apartment complex now where Hank Cochran had an apartment and I had an apartment. There were a lot of entertainers up there then. And they would park the camper there and come inside and always have coffee with us and take showers or whatever. And Bonnie and I always had a great time visiting and anything they might need, you know, for their travels. Why did your dad never want to move to Nashville? I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, I have no idea. Uh, might have had something. I don't know. That's a good question, Bill. Um, when he I, did move here for, for a short time, I well, think. Well, he did. About th three or four years. He said it was the most unproductive career time yeah. in his career. <laughs> he left. Yeah. He came here. It was better where he came from, I think. Yeah. I don't know. That's a good question, Bill. I never asked him. Uh, might have had something to do with that Kern River. I don't know. Well, like you say, you said he came here for a while and it was an unproductive... Yeah, he said, he said he stayed here a few years, three or four years, and said it was the most unproductive time in his whole career. He just couldn't, you know, it, it wasn't meant for him, you know. I don't think Merle knew a whole lot of people here. Because I remember one year, the very one of the first CMA gatherings... We were all sitting in some uh, some big area, a lot of people, and they were coming in the doorway, and Merle and Bonnie and the band, they all came in as a group, and they stood there, and I sat there for about uh, almost a minute, and I realized that nobody, nobody was going to go greet them. So I got up and went over, Went over, I was glad to see him. See him, uh, but they looked like the the, uh, the Lawton gang had come to town. <laughs> it was early on, and they came as a group, and uh, and uh, that, that whole thing seemed unfriendly to me. So I wanted to go at least make them welcome. I, I love Merle and Bonnie and all of them. I think possibly, because um, he used to talk about the, you know how it is, Bill. I don't care if it's Hollywood or Nashville or anywhere you go. You know, there's, there's not a whole lot of people like Vince Gill. 
uh, in the world. I mean, the music, the music is full of the best and the worst people you could ever want to know. There just don't seem to be a whole lot of middle ground. You know, there's a lot of phony, then there's real people. And, you know, contrary to popular belief, Dad never wanted to be a star. He just wanted to play, he wanted to make music. He didn't want to work it, you know? And Nashville is really, it's about being a star as a rule. Not, not everybody. But he was in love with the music. And I think here that he fell out of love with his guitar, like he said in that one song, you know? It was just too phony for him. And that's not everybody, but you know what I'm saying. Um, that's what I, person I'm starting to wonder if he, he liked playing music. He didn't want to work, you know. Nashville makes it work. I think he liked <laughs> recording here in Nashville, but I think he liked writing uh, out on the West Coast. I yeah. think that was, he, he loved Northern California and people would reach out to him out there. Like I said, he, he felt comfortable. He was home. Yeah. Right? yeah. It was home. It was oh, home. Lord, That's yeah. I don't, he had, who had, knows? He had knows? absolutely no taste for the politics that goes on no. in Nashville. None. If the he had been a Conway Twitty, he could have right. had 150 number one records. And when I say that, if he'd been willing to work the radio politics and, you know, that stuff that y'all know that goes on behind the scenes, back when they had the, the three different, you know, charts and all that good stuff, if Dad was willing to play the game, he would have never had anything but a number one record. But it's in spite of my dad that he had the 110 top 10 records, which is more than anybody in music history, by the way. So in spite of himself, because he did everything... He walked off the Ed Sullivan show just before filming after rehearsing for a week because they wanted to do some hokey country, uh, almost tongue in cheek, making fun of country music. And he said, I'm out of here. I ain't doing this shit. And they said, You'll never work again. You know, and uh, he walked off the Ed Sullivan show, left him right there. And um, it's that kind of stuff that dad was a rebel, man. He, was, uh, he, did, he broke all the dad gum rules. Anyway, Merle shared something with me. Uh, maybe this is probably six months ago. And of all folks to say this, uh, Merle was so, uh, uh, he just did not have the ego that uh, a lot do have. But he said, Ronnie, he said, it surprised me more than anyone on my success. <laughs> he said, every time I had a number one record, he said, I was more surprised than anybody that people liked what I was doing. And I think in spite of himself, as you said, that's why they like Merle Haggard was because he was down right down there with them. And, uh, you know, hats off to Hag. He wasn't acting. He was reacting. Yeah, boy. You know. When I had him on my radio show, I told him, I said, we're getting toward the end of the show. And I said, Merle, I've never had a chance to tell you this. But I said, you're my favorite country singer. And I was kind of looking down at some papers as to where we were going from there. And there was this deadly silence in the room just total silence, and I thought, my goodness, have I offended him? I didn't mean to do that, and I looked over there, and he was crying. Yeah, that's how, that's how humble. He, I, just one person saying, you're my favorite singer, No, that was, was crying. That was the great Bill Anderson said. Yeah, I was saying, you, it wasn't just some you're, person. You're, you're a great songwriter, <laughs> you. and coming from you, yeah. that meant so much. It's true. Wow, I we love thought, you, Bill. Thank you. We well, love you a lot. I loved him too. Thank you, Jenny. Sing us a song. I will. Just one more quick, very personal thing for me with Merle. First of all, the only two people that I've ever been around in my life that their eyes do the same thing as Willie Nelson and Merle Haggard, and they don't look at you. They look deep into you. Has anybody ever noticed that? I mean, just that intensity. I've always felt like you couldn't lie to either one of them. I feel sorry for you boys if you ever tried. There was no way. But after I had a real bad car accident in 77, and uh, they put me back together, the whole one side of my face rebuilt, eye back in the socket, and jaw wired together. I was in beautiful shape. And I didn't want to see anybody, but they said, Merle wants to come out and see you. So... I mean, <laughs> it's Merle Haggard. You, you make an exception, right? But Merle came out in that intense look. He was just looking right straight at me, and I'm thinking, oh, I know I don't look very good. And he finally nodded, and he said, you're fine. He said, they told me you were going to be, but I just had to come see for myself. It just meant the world to me. And so, with that, with the tear in my eye and my voice, I'm going to try to sing.
I don't know if it was Noel or Benny over here. Which all you were, all he was started singing, looking for a place to fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> was that you, Noel? Yes, sir. <laughs> Jim Lauderdale, all dressed up and very quiet. And somewhere today. to go. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I've been quiet because I've been just drinking all of this in, and uh, like everybody here, I'm such a huge fan of Merle's and his music meant so much to me, uh, like everybody here. And I think we all, once we discovered Merle, went at it passionately to try to find out more, everything we could about him and to hear as much as we could of his music. And, you know, Jeannie, I was gonna mention that and what you were talking about, how he didn't look at you, he looked inside of you and the, the second time I got to open up for Merle, I was up in Wisconsin, in Madison, Wisconsin, and the promoter, this lady, Laurel Nash, uh, said, do you wanna meet Merle? And I'd, I'd met him before, but I you know, said, sure, of course, but I was so nervous, you know, I was almost afraid to meet him just because I revered him so much. And I went on the bus and he was, I had a deck of cards and he was sitting there and, and um, I'd, I'd written a song with a guy named Costas that used to write a lot of hits here in town. We wrote a song called Merle World, so I gave that to him on a CD. And he just, the way he looked 
and my eyes, you know, it was like no, nobody had ever looked at me like that before or inside of me. And it just automatically put me at ease and I felt really comfortable because I was scared about also going on before him, but I, that just gave me kind of a Eddie Stubbs said piece. something interesting that kind of relates to that. You said he really looked inside you. That's what yeah. He said Merle told him one time that he didn't listen to a record, just didn't listen to just the record, that he listened down inside the grooves. Mm -hmm. He said, I try to take my ears down inside the grooves and see what's really making that record what it is. Wow. I guess that's part of what made him so great and why we love him so much. He just absorbed so much. And I, I guess with his influences of uh, Jimmy Rogers and, and Lefty and uh, Bob Wills, he had kind of a unique perspective on things, I think, with, with those influences and kind of the fusion of that stuff and just doing what he wanted to do. And, uh, you know, there'll never be anybody like him and he set the bar so high and all you know us singer songwriters can do is just try to do a little bit you know what he did i think merle was that way about everything i mean every time i ever talked to him he was that way he he heard everything you said but as you said it he analyzed it you know and i was sitting in the atlanta airport one time in fact tony booth's brother larry and i were sitting there and we were working up negotiations for a contract for me and this attorney. We were talking about Merle because they just got through doing some stuff on the Poncho and Lefty thing, I think. And he said, let me tell you about Merle. He said, he's one of the sharpest guys I've ever met. He said, because we meet with him and we come out with all of our experience, all of our know-how, all of this stuff, and we tell him exactly how this is one of the best deals that you can have. And he said, he'll listen to you for 45 minutes until you get through. And then he said in two sentences, he'll tear down everything you built up. <laughs> and he was that way. He was that way. He could, he could look inside you and, and uh, either know what you were talking about or know what you shouldn't have been talking about. He didn't have a lot of formal education, did he? No, but he was, he was nobody's dumbass. No, sure. he was uh, very that street was smart. Very, yeah, he just, you know, he was blessed. Um, he had a vision. You know, he's, he was given a gift. Um, you see past the, the surface of something, and he had that gift, and obviously his, his vision was in music. And, um, uh, but you know, me and my dad talked about this a couple of times because, you know, and I'm gonna point this out again. Guys, I hope I don't keep boring you to death with Jesus, okay? But if that bores you, then you got a problem, okay? But I will simply say this. My dad and I talked about this because, you know, the Father has given everyone gifts, you know? And not one any more important than the other either, by the way. I mean, but the, you know, he's, he says he wants to bless you and give you peace and give you joy. My dad's source of joy was his music. You know, um, his cup raneth over and we've enjoyed it. But I'm convinced that he was given that gift to give, get him through this crazy life. And it brought him joy, gave him, gave him life. And, uh, you know, but we, me and him talked about it many times. We get so ate up and caught up with people that have been given a gift and forget all about the gift giver in the proposition. You know, um, dad didn't invent this thing. It was given to him. He can't really receive the credit for this. I'm glad he shared it with us in public, but the fact is he did not, he's not the author of this. The father in heaven is. And uh, anyway, so I would like, you know, throw a little glory towards the creator of the gift. That would be the father. Jim Merle said an awful lot when he wrote a song called I'm Always on a Mountain When I Fall. I think that's the one you're going to do. Yeah. And uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to point out that Jeannie Seeley sang harmony on this uh, I'm, cut when I'm Merle Merle's recorded. I'm Merle's dead, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I sang on this. And... Most of my life I've almost been a winner I 
I've come so close But never really won Just when I thought I'd finally made it I found myself back where I started from I hate to say I'm giving up But I believe Losing's just become a way of life for me Losing doesn't be so bad at all But I'm always on a mountain when I fall You came along and had me, had me believing. For once in my life, my luck had finally changed. But now you say you're gonna leave. Seems everything I do winds up the same. I hate to say I'm giving up, but I believe losing's just become a way of life for me. Losing wouldn't be so bad at all, but I'm always on a mountain. When I fall Losing wouldn't be so bad at all But I'm always On a mountain When I fall Tim Lauderdale. Tell you what, it doesn't get much better than this. Thank you, Jim. We need to take a break. We'll have more in our tribute to Merle Haggard after this. <laughs> 